Please take your seat. And our first speaker is David Derua, who's a Turing Fellow and also from the University of Oxford. David. Stay close to the mics. Thanks for coming along. Um, yeah, I'm Dave Jarrua. I'm a musicologist. Um, gosh, I'm recognizing several people in the audience who, who know me already, but lovely to meet everyone else as well. I'm going to talk about sort of computers and music, but I've got a particular sort of narrative journey here, which is in the title. Um, I'm going to talk about using computers, humans using computers to do creative things, but then Computers doing things that require creativity in humans, so I'll kind of end up there. And that's, that's, the, uh, that's the music and AI piece. But my story uh, all starts uh, around one particular point in history, because I'm going to take us back to the time of Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage, which is the early 1800s. So another title for this talk would be Creative Algorithmic in Interventions and the Imagination of La Ada Lovelace. And by imagination of Ada Lovelace, I mean her imagination, which we'll talk about, um, but also how we imagine her, because she has been, if you like, appropriated in different ways. And I hope that, um, I hope the audio is working, I'm hearing different effects up here. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll explain something about the different ways that Ada Lovelace has been portrayed or even ventriloquized. I don't know if everyone knows about her, let me just say a, a, a few words. So she's born in the early 1800s. Um, she was born into quite a privileged uh, background, and uh, you know, her father was uh, in, in, infamously um, Lord Byron. She's held up today as the first programmer, first female programmer, um, as an icon of women in computing, and that's really, really important. But that isn't all she did, and I hope I will present something about that in particular, um, what she has done around music. She collaborated with Charles Babbage, um, famously the uh, inventor of the difference engine, you can find one of those in the Science Museum, um, and also the design of the analytical engine which hasn't been built yet. Uh, this is an artist's impression, um, Sidney Padra's impression of the analytical engine. You can see it's a huge steam-powered computer. You can see a steam engine there. And all the different bits of that computer, although they have strange names like the mill, um, are actually pretty much, surprisingly, what we're used to today when we're working with modern processes. So this is you know, early 1800s, well ahead of its time. A little bit of a story about the two of them. So uh, Lovelace and, and Babbage knew each other, they, they worked together, um, they devised, is a good word, devised programs together. She understood um, the design of this thing, the analytical engine. And one day uh, Babbage was giving a talk about the analytical engine, um, and this was in in Italy, and it was transcribed, um, interestingly, in French <laughs> by um, Luigi Menabrea, who went on to become the, the Italian Prime Minister some years later. Um, back in London, uh, Charles Wheatstone, who's another character from the early 1800s, um, suggested to Babbage that um, Lovelace could translate the, um, the, the French description of the analytical engine into English. She did that. It's published in this volume called Scientific Memoirs. Um, and in doing that, she extended the article by about three times with her own notes. And it's those notes that she published there, uh, which is you know, the legacy that we uh, talk about today when we discuss the work of, of Ada Lovelace. Um, for example, and there'll be another quote later, this one is quite important in the computers and music community, where she talks about whether the analytical engine could generate music. In fact, she was talking more generally about doing things other than with calculations and numbers. Uh, and that's important because at the time, that was the focus for these, these machines like the analytical engine. It was about calculation. Uh, but she could see that you could use them for other things. And I, I would claim that interdisciplinarity and that sort of vision of the computers being used in an art context as well is actually what makes her stand out. Um, I'll come back to that. So on music, she says, supposing, for instance, that the fundamental relations of pitch sounds in the science of harmony and musical composition were susceptible to such expression and adaptations, that's the operations of the analytical engine, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music 
of any degree of complexity or extent. Unfortunately, she didn't um, live to do this, and the NS engine was never built. Uh, unfortunately, and there's a long story about Babbage trying to get funding to do this, but that's another story. Um, so we kind of did a thought experiment, and we said, well, what if um, Ada Lovelace had lived longer? What if Charles Babbage had built the NS engine? What music would they have produced? So this is kind of a creative response to this, th th this historical story. So in 2015, we had a symposium in Oxford celebrating the 200th anniversary of the birth of Ada Lovelace, um, organized by my colleague Ursula Martin. Um, on stage there in this picture, you can see Emily Howard, uh, who's a composer. And Emily Howard is probably in another stage as we speak, because my collaborators in this work are presenting on the creative stage at the same time. <laughs> um, so Emily is a mathematician and computer scientist who's now become a composer. And she composed a trilogy for Ada Lovelace. And that's why we had her at the event. And in particular, she's very good at explaining how she uses mathematics in the generation of the music, or in the composition of the music. And that's what we picked up on. Uh, and so, so in order to work out what Ada Lovelace might have done, hypothetically or counterfactually, um, we took a, an emulator or a simulator of the analytic engine. So the physical thing doesn't exist, but you can run one in software. Um, and we took some mathematics from the early 1800s. We talked to mathematicians in order to understand what, you know, the math that was around then is around now, but lots of math that around now wasn't around then. So we had to understand the maths. Um, and we did some simple, actually, but remarkably effective algorithmic composition. Um, and for the purposes of that event and some of the events we've done since then, we simply use the Fibonacci number sequence. And one of the properties of the Fibonacci sequence is that if you reduce it by clock arithmetic, modulo something, 12 for a clock, um, then um, it generates a repeating sequence. Uh, and we've done all sorts of experiments with that where we play the sequence to an audience, we ask them what bits of music they hear in that, we pull those pieces of music out and we use them in compositions. So um, a couple we had at the time, this is my favorite, Fib 35, um, which we have a, a jazz version of. Um, and this is another one where we sort of um, cut things vertically in, in all the numbers that were generated uh, to produce a piece of music that sounds a bit like 1970s children's TV theme music. Anyway, um, more recently, last October in Abbey Road at an event, we produced a piece of music that really is clock arithmetic because this is Fibonacci um, modulo 12, like a clock. Um, and by taking that sequence of numbers, we, we never change the, the numbers, we don't, we don't touch the maths, but we can change the mapping of the numbers um, into, into the music. We play that sequence against itself at different times, different speeds, backwards, inverted, um, much in the way people might, might have played around with. Trying to experiment with an idea that um, L Lovelace talked about, about sort of scientific music. So it's trying to capture that idea. And we had a human performer uh, on a harp, because the harp is the instrument that Ada Lovelace played. Um, and we, we did that kind of, um, can the audience tell which bits are created by human and which by machine? I'll come back to that point. Actually, you could tell <laughs> really easily. You can often tell in those experiments by looking at the face of the performer. Um, and sort of to complete the Doctor Who type story on that, imagine we'd gone in the TARDIS back to the 1800s and had an episode of Doctor Who where we met Lovelace and Babbage and we created some music. Imagine you now put Lovelace in the TARDIS and bring her back to today. Uh, what would she do now? What would she make of computing today? So taking the same code that we use there, we've programmed that up on a number of Arduinos. Um, these are bigger ones. We have smaller ones as well. Um, so each of these is like an analytical engine. Um, and then we've done some experiments with having multiple things. I don't know if they would have ever thought about having more than one analytical engine. So we've done those experiments as well. You can see some numbers here because it's all about numbers and notes. So that's a kind of a creative response to something that happened historically. It's an exploration, um, a counterfactual, or you know, a past future. Um, is that useful academic research? Well, we actually make the point that it is. Um, because what we're doing is understanding the process um, of, of the time rather than just studying, if you like, the product. So th there's a sort of method within um, in humanities research where you do close reading. You look very hard at the literature uh, and the evidence that is, that is still around from the time through accidents of preservation and discovery. Um, and we work with the, the, the Lovelace Letters archive in the Bodleian Library. Um, and you can, you, can, you can read those very carefully. And lots of biographers of Ada Lovelace have done exactly that. And there are many books uh, on, on Ada Lovelace. 
But what we were trying to understand is much more what was going on in her head. So first of all, we're trying to understand her, the person, rather than the icon. And we're trying to understand what's going on in her head. Um, and, and by actually doing it, by repeating it, um, we, we believe we get more insights into that. So in a sense, the digital prototyping that we're doing here is a kind of close reading. It's a, it's, it's a kind of new humanities method to understand what was going on at the time. And that prototype we're building is kind of a theory. So that counterfactual story I've told is kind of a theory about what might have happened. The other picture here, incidentally, is um, a bit of Babbage's design notation. He's an extraordinary engineer. Um, and and this, this is a notation that's used um, to describe the mechanics of the analytical engine. And another bit of um, experimental humanities is that a colleague at Royal Holloway, um, Adrian Johnston, is building bits of an analytical engine from a mechanical engineering viewpoint and trying to understand those designs and really how Babbage intended that notation and how well those machines work. And it isn't how they, just how they work when they work, it's how they work when they, when they, they fail. It's what happens when things go wrong. Because that's all designed in and you wouldn't know that unless you actually built the things to find out. So that's our academic perspective on this. In terms of the, my sort of issue about the appropriation of Lovelace, it's really important that she's an icon for STEM. Incidentally, I say Lovelace, not Ada, because we talk about Babbage, we, talk, we use surnames, but for some reason, with Ada Lovelace, she just gets called Ada. So I'm, I'm being consistent in calling her Lovelace. Not that that was always her name. Um, and um, in the January issue of the BBC Music Magazine, I had an article that sort of challenged that and said, actually, okay, we, we, we can claim she's the first female programmer, but you have really to be much more nuanced and, and, and accurate about that. She devised programs in collaboration with Charles Babbage and was the first to publish those. Okay, that's what actually happened. Um, what she was definitely first on, in an undisputed way, is thinking about using computers for things other than uh, calculation. Uh, and that isn't what the others were doing at the time. So I hold her up not as an icon of STEM, but an icon of STEAM. So I'm putting art in there as well. Um, that article goes on to explain how important music was. She wrote in her letters that music was at least as important as mathematics to her. And that isn't something that the Lovelace biographers often talk about. How does this fit in with the Turing Institute? Well, I'm working there as part of a, a special interest group called Data Science and Digital Humanities. One of the things we have going on in that uh, group, that group uh, incidentally, is a project called Living with Machines, led by Ruth Arnott at Queen Mary. Um, and this is sort of re-examining um, that period of time we've just been talking about. We're looking at the Industrial Revolution, but applying data science techniques, look, looking at the record of, records of the time, looking at newspapers and so on, in order to do a, a data science-led re-examination of the Industrial Revolution. And that's something obviously that's been widely studied, but not in this way before. So that's a really good example of a digital humanities project going on in the Turing, which is very much data science-oriented. Um, so. Um, have a look on the web to find out more about that. The project's only recently started. I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about it in the future. While I have a, some weaving on the screen, a quote from Lovelace to make my point about uh, not just numbers. We may, most apt, we, we may say most aptly that the analytic engine weaves algebraical patterns just as the Jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. Uh, just good evidence that she wasn't just thinking about calculations. So this is our group at the, the, the Turing. Um, one of the areas of data science and music is using computers to analyze music. And that's really the digital musicology piece. It's sometimes called computational musicology, music information retrieval. Um, it's a, an area of data science that's been around for quite a while. It's a big, vibrant community. It's probably been around since before things were called data science. Um, so there's definitely a lot of data science we can do in the analysis of music. For example, we recently had a, an event in the Turing um, and these were the series of talks. So this gives you a flavor about not just how we use data science to analyze music, but the applications of having done that. So these are real applied pieces of data science. These come out of a project called FAST, Fusing Audio and Somatic Technologies, that's incidentally, coincidentally, also led from Queen Mary um, by Mark Sandler. Now, another quote, as I go on my narrative journey to computational creativity, another quote from Lovelace. Um, the analytic engine has no pretensions to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. It can follow analysis, but it has no power of anticipating any analytical relations or truths. Its province is to assist us in making available what we are already acquainted with. So this is sort of Lovelace on 
machines and creativity. And in the same way that music quotation from her notes has been widely cited since, especially in the last two or three decades, so is this one to do with computers and creativity. And it's led to quite a discussion over the years. So um, Alan Turing, let's mention the man himself, um, um, in his famous sort of um, Turing test paper, uh, Computing Machinery and Intelligence in 1950, so just over 100 years after Lovelace, her paper was 1843, um, talks about Lady Lovelace's objection um, to the idea that, that, that um, the computers could do things that would require creativity in humans. Uh, and Margaret Bowden in Sussex, in her book, The Creative Mind, Myths and Mechanisms, teased apart these issues about um, creativity into four separate questions uh, which you can address in this area. So it's been a very provocative um, quotation from, from Lovelace's work. That debate still goes on. So um, you can you all decide yourselves wh where you fall on this one. Um, where this has taken us is from using computers to do creative things, like the algorithmic composition, to using computers to do things that require creativity in humans. And this is where we're using AI to generate music. And this is exactly what's being presented on another stage as we speak. Um, and what we've done to engage people with this work, rather like the harp example I gave earlier, um, is these experiments which we kind of call Barkov Bot. So we have some music that's been composed, and by composed I mean put together, literally, by a PhD student, Rob Nadelow, where he's generated some music um, from an AI in the style of Bach. The author of the code is also around somewhere, uh, uh, Christine Payne. Um, and then he's taken those fragments that have been generated by AI and he's interspersed them with real bits of bark. And we kind of have this game where uh, you get someone, to, a human, to perform the work and the audience has to say which bits are human and which bits are AI. So we have people holding up a piece of card, red or blue, uh, showing which it is. We did this at the Barbican uh, in 9th of March, did it again in Oxford last week, we're doing it again later this week at the Royal Northern College of Music. Um, and it's really interesting, and different audiences are, are, are good at spotting um, the, the difference between the two. Um, but it doesn't convey our real intention, because it suggests that what we're trying to do is replace humans with computers, and we're not. I, I'm more in the Lovelace quotation mode here. What we're trying to do is assist humans in being creative. So Rob Laidlow is an orchestral composer. He's using AI to assist him in orchestral composition. So that's where we've come in on this spectrum about uh, can computers be creative. I'll be finishing now. Um, but just if anyone wants to follow up, something to look out for is in November at the Barbican, uh, 2nd of November, we have kind of an Ada Lovelace Day at the Barbican. It's not quite the right date for the Ada Lovelace Day, but I don't know. Um, and um, all the people I've mentioned, Rob Laidlow, Marcus Sotoy, oops, um, <laughs> um, Emily Howard, will all be there and we're putting on a day about exactly this, and this revisiting of the Ada Lovelace story. Thank you very much. Miguel Rodriguez, who is another fellow of the Alan Turing Institute. Miguel. All right, so uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure uh, for me uh, to be here. So it's a, it's a pleasure for, uh, for me to be here and uh, to be talking about some of our uh, recent work on uh, artificial intelligence for uh, art uh, investigation. So my, my background is on uh, uh, mathematics of data. Uh, I'm an electrical and uh, computer uh, engineer. But it's been, uh, I've developed an interest in, in this area in, uh, in the last few years, the last couple of years. And it's been a, a privilege to work in this area because we have had the opportunity to work with people at the other end of the spectrum. So art historians, curators, uh, heritage scientists, people that have a completely different perspective. But uh, equally important to me is that uh, it also flows back in our direction because this field in particular, it presents us with some very concrete challenges that motivates us, for example, to uh, develop new algorithms that uh, you know, do not occur, for example, in other challenges 
occurring in uh, other domains. So let me just give you an idea about the uh, type of challenges that we have here. And uh, uh, this has been, uh, some of you may have seen this, uh, it has appeared on the news uh, about 18 months back. And it's a, a portrait of Sir John Maitland, uh, the Lord Chancellor of, of, of Scotland. And uh, this painting has been uh, examined under uh, x-rays. And uh, what people have discovered is that uh, beneath this painting, there's a portrait of Mary, uh, Queen of Scots. And this has generated quite a bit of excitement because uh, uh, portraits of the Queen are, are, are uh, very rare, and therefore it was a very interesting discovery. And the conjecture is that, uh, well, at the time, uh, it was uh, probably not a very good idea to have portraits of the Queen at the time of her uh, execution. So this, has, this may have motivated you know, people to commission to paint something on top of this uh, other painting. And uh, examples like these abound in, uh, in, in this field. So for example, Van Gogh. Uh, Van Gogh was a very poor painter, and therefore he did not have the means to buy, for example, canvas. So people estimate that about 30% or so of, of, of his paintings, they have been uh, covered by another painting. So there's uh, concealed, uh, concealed designs. So one problem that arises, for example, in this field is, I mean, is there a way, for example, to reveal some of these concealed designs that, uh, that are present in many of the paintings that we now observe, for example, in galleries? So this is one of the challenge. But uh, in this field, there is, you know, far uh, many more uh, challenges and questions. So, you know, beyond, for example, trying to reveal concealed designs, one might also be interested, for example, in visualizing the drawings. So the drawings that painters, for example, do as they conceive their artwork. Uh, there is the need also to understand, for example, the materials that are present in a painting for conservation purposes, for example. And part of the challenge has to do with the fact that some of these objects are extremely complex. And here we've got an example, for example, of a cross-section of, of, of a painting. And of course, you know, there's, there's the support, uh, the canvas, for example, where a painter eventually produces uh, uh, the artwork. But on top of the painting, there's what we call, there's a ground layer, then eventually there's these preparatory sketches, and then many, many paint layers that eventually give you know, rise to uh, this design. So for us, for example, to you know, understand the painting and eventually, for example, understand materials and the different designs present in a painting, so there's a need to understand all these you know, complex, uh, complex structure. Now, one way is to try, for example, to uh, take samples of, of, of the painting, micro samples, and you know, people do that, but of course this is destructive, it is invasive, and there's so much we can do. So the other alternative is to recur, for example, to imaging type of te techniques. And here, for example, uh, one may, for example, uh, resort to electromagnetic uh, radiation in order to see through, for example, the various layers that are present in the painting. So what we see so is, is for example, uh, the response of a painting to uh, a visible light. But if we were, for example, to use, say, other wavelengths or other zones of the spectrum, then there is the hope that we can probe through all these various layers in the painting to try to understand its complex, uh, complex structure. And in fact, so this is what people have been doing in museums and in heritage science for uh, some time. In fact, upon the introduction of, of, of x-rays, so, so initially, you know, x-rays were tested on, on a painting. And x-rays, for example, or x-radiography, they, they have been uh, used routinely in museums since uh, the 30s or so. In addition to x-rays, people have been using many other imaging type of techniques, for example, People have been using ultraviolet-induced visible fluorescence. People have been using uh, infrared re reflectography. Now is used routinely in uh, uh, museums. Uh, and, and, and beyond that, so people have been using more recently all kinds of sophisticated type of techniques. For example, multispectral imaging, hyperspectral imaging, X-ray fluorescence. Some of these instruments, in fact, now they are becoming you know, portable so that they can be used, for example, in, uh, in museums. So, for example, if we were to take this painting, uh, Dona Isabel de Porcel, so it's a painting in the National Gallery by Francisco uh, de Goya. 
So if we were to observe it, say, under different, uh, uh, different electromagnetic uh, areas of the spectrum, so in X-ray, so this is what it looks like. Under infrared, this is what it looks like. And some of the more recent techniques, multispectral imaging, hyperspectral imaging, and X-ray fluorescence, so what they produce essentially is what we call uh, data cubes. And essentially, these are uh, images of the painting at different wavelengths or images of the painting at different uh, uh, energies in the case of X-ray uh, uh, fluorescence for each pixel. So what they do is they produce a spectrum, or we can also slice the cube in the XY dimension to get, for example, uh, an image. Now, the availability of all this data, so in fact, what it does, it, it opens up the possibility for us to use digital technology, machine learning in particular, to try to understand paintings and address some of the challenges that I've mentioned before. And in fact, this is not entirely new. So for example, the Van Gogh project, which was introduced, I believe, around 2008, 2009. So this was initiated by Rick Johnson from Cornell University. Uh, in partnership, I believe, with Van Gogh Museum. And the idea was to try to use images of paintings to understand, for example, Van Gogh. And since then, you know, people have been using all kinds of techniques, signal processing, image processing, machine learning, to try to understand uh, paintings, uh, paintings better. Man but many of the techniques that people have been using, or the data that people have been using to understand paintings, were very simple data sets based on, for example, RGB images of paintings, X-ray images, uh, uh, or, for example, infrared images. And uh, what we are trying to do, so this is, uh, in fact, this is being funded now by EPSRC. There's also elements that are being funded by uh, the Royal Society. So what we are doing in this project, which is a partnership between my university, Imperial College, uh, the National Gallery, and there's also other partners on board, so we are trying to leverage all these huge uh, i-dimensional and multi-dimensional data sets that are being produced by, uh, uh, in museums on artwork, in particular, hyperspectral images and uh, X-ray fluorescence type of images to try to understand, uh, to try to understand paintings. So uh, for example, you know, some of the uh, questions that we are addressing or in, the, in, in this project relate, number one, so we want to collect and prepare uh, new data sets acquired on paintings, primarily paintings from uh, the National Gallery, but we are also engaging with other galleries, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, for example. And then on top of these data sets that we are developing, we also want then to uh, develop all kinds of data analysis algorithms to make sense of the paintings. So for example, to understand the different materials that are present in a painting, which of course is extremely relevant for conservation type of uh, uh, purposes. Uh, beyond that, so we are also addressing uh, a number of case studies. So beyond material characterization, we want, for example, to reveal, uh, say, concealed designs in a painting. We want to reveal pentimenti. We want, for example, also to reveal the under drawings present in a painting. Now, we are complementing these research activities, which uh, involve the development of new uh, algorithms with a, a number of impact activities. Uh, such as, for example, the development of open software tools that we want to make available to uh, museums so that they can interpret their paintings, uh, but also ran, uh, uh, organize many other activities such as workshops, conferences, and also launch within the UK a, a network on, say, artificial intelligence for art investigation, which is also something that we are trying to pursue in conjunction with uh, uh, the Turing. Now, I would like to terminate with, with, with a case study, something that we have done uh, very recently that showcases what, is, uh, what AI promises for uh, this, particular, this particular field. And what I'm showing here is, is the Ghent Altarpiece, which is a, a, a very famous uh, painting by uh, the Van Eyck uh, uh, brothers. So it's an altarpiece, so essentially there's an open and there's a closed position. So the idea is that on festive days, this altarpiece is open, and on non-festive days, the altarpiece is, 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 is closed. So there's some panels that here, in this case, are painted on both sides, and then there's others that are painted on a single side uh, only. And the problem that we have been uh, tasked with, or the challenge for us, was the following. So if we, for example, examine some of the outer panels, so here we've got, uh, say, one outer panel related, for example, to the image of Eve. 
So uh, on, on, on the rear panel, so what we have is, say, an angel. So, so, uh, and if we are to x-ray, for example, this painting, so I've, as I mentioned before, there is an interest uh, in observing a painting under different uh, radiations because this reveals interesting properties about the painting. So in this particular case, if we were to x-ray, say, this particular panel, so what we are going to get is a superposition of x-rays where each one is going to contain features of the images on both sides of the panel. So in the x-ray that we are showing here, for example, so we've got features relating to Eve, and we also have features related to the angel on the other side of the panel. Now, it's difficult to interpret this x-ray because it contains the superposition of two images. So our challenge was to try to disentangle these two x-rays. So producing one that relates, say, to the image of Eve only, and producing another one that relates only to uh, the angel. And uh, so what we use in this particular case, so in fact, this is a problem that we have uh, pursued for a couple of years now. So we have published uh, on, 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 on this problem using all types of techniques, not entirely satisfactory. And more recently, so we have used an AI type of approach, which we showcase here. And our approach essentially involves using a, a deep learning type of algorithm. So what we do here is we've got this uh, deep learning algorithm that is trying to convert, say, an image, so both images of one side of the panel and the other image from the other side of the panel into the corresponding X-ray. And so it's an image-to-image -image translation network, let's put it that way. But in addition, we want to do that in such a way that the sum of these two X-rays, synthetically generated X-rays, they are consisting with the mixed X-ray that uh, we have uh, access to. So, I mean, this is the general idea. So there's a deep network or two deep networks behind this idea. So then, you know, what we need to do is to train, to train these networks. But what I would like to emphasize here, and again, you know, related to some of my uh, previous remarks that uh, the nature of some of the problems that arise in this domain are very different from those that arise in other domains is that this is entirely unsupervised. So we don't have examples here uh, uh, upon which we can learn how to separate x-rays. So instead, this is a completely self-supervised algorithm. There is no notion of training set. There is no notion of a testing set. I mean, the training set and the testing set is exactly the same. It's entirely uh, a self-supervised type of uh, algorithm. And these are some of the results that we can actually produce. So for example, in this case, so we've got uh, the, the, the image on one side of the panel, so this relates to Adam. We've got the image on the other side of the panel, again, so there's, I think in this case, there's a prophet on the other side. And I'm also showcasing the mixed x-ray. So this is the data that we have access to. And upon uh, training and applying our uh, algorithm, so what we get is we get presumably so the image of or the x-ray associated with Adam, and we also have the x-ray associated with uh, the other side of the panel, okay? Now, just to give you an idea on how this, for example, might compare to the state of the art, so these are some of the results that we had previously, and we can see that, you know, previous algorithms, they do not quite get to separate the x-rays, and using AI type approaches, we uh, are able to achieve a far much better separation. So we have tested these on uh, the Adam panel. We have also tested these on Eve's panel. And again, so very, uh, very similar, uh, very similar results. Right, so uh, to summarize, so, so we are convinced that uh, artificial intelligence technology has potential to address uh, outstanding problems arising in uh, uh, art, uh, art investigation uh, with implications, for example, for art presentation, for uh, art, uh, art uh, conservation. There's many other outstanding problems, each with uh, uh, specific challenges. And in my view, so I think that this is an excellent opportunity because not only are we solving very interesting problems arising in this particular domain, but also this domain is, is offering us the opportunity to develop entirely new algorithms and supervised approaches, semi-supervised approaches, developing understanding that, for example, uh, we have not yet, uh, yet achieved. Uh, so this is the team uh, behind this work. So, well, the champions of... 
this work are uh, my student, uh, Zara. So she, she was one of the driving forces uh, behind this work. She's about to graduate, as well as uh, Barack Sober uh, at uh, Duke uh, University. But we have also had the privilege to work with uh, applied mathematicians and members of uh, the National Gallery. So this is an area that we are developing further. We are also developing this in uh, the Turing. So we are trying to launch initiatives in the Turing uh, associated with this area. So if you're interested, you know, please do uh, get in touch. Thank you, Miguel. We have a third very interesting perspective now from Luba Elliott, who is an artist, a researcher, and an AI curator. So over to you, Luba. Um, we've had two very interesting talks, both on music and using AI for art investigation. And my talk will look at how artists are using and thinking about AI in, uh, in contemporary art. So I'll give you an overview of what's been happening over the past few years, starting with uh, this point. And how many of you are familiar with, uh, with this type of aesthetic? with Deep Dream. OK, lots of hands are going up. This is very good. I think the media did its job well, even if now this project is maybe for like four or five years old now. But I think this Deep, 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 deep Dream project, which came out of uh, one of the Google offices in uh, July, I think it was uh, 2015 or so, it's, uh, it basically works like this. So you have a face, and then this algorithm gets excited by various random features in the face, and it starts to emphasize them and find random colors and creatures. And you can think about, I guess, why this type of aesthetic would be interesting um, artistically, right? Because it's kind of very bright. It's very kind of particular. And um, yeah, I think the mainstream loved it. and. Uh, Lots of artists from the technical community started uh, experimenting with it. And yeah, so I, I include this project by uh, Daniel Ambrosi, who is uh, normally a computational photographer. And he likes to combine those techniques with, with Deep Dream. And um, I don't know how well you can actually see the screen, but uh, there is. Um, there are some trees, and it's like a, a landscape scene. And Deep Dream is used to really kind of uh, shape some of the um, features and textures in the image, but it's not completely overpowering. And uh, I always like to show that as a good example of how you can use one of these AI techniques for, um, yeah, to really kind of experiment and play around with the aesthetics without making the work explicitly just about uh, that technique. And uh, then came uh, Style Transfer, which is kind of in uh, September of the same year in uh, 2015. And um, yeah, that technique basically works by, um, if, if you have a photograph, this technique can um, change it into the style of Monet or Picasso or another artist. And um, if you don't know much about contemporary art or how the current art world works, then you're likely to be, I don't know, quite excited by it because you can change your portrait into the style of your favorite impressionist artist. And um, I remember a couple of summers ago, there was an app called Prisma that let you do that very quickly. But um, whenever I show something like this to the art community, particularly those who work in the contemporary art field, they're always shocked that um, people in the tech community would um, consider that a valuable technique for artistic um, work currently. Because of course, uh, you could look at this as a way of simply replicating the styles of artists' past and not really innovating or thinking how you can render a scene in a very kind of different way. So yeah, it has, uh, it is, I guess, controversial to an extent. And yeah, here are some examples of Gene Kogan. 
um, kind of playing around with um, with style transfer and uh, Mona Lisa, and then also expanding the definition of what style transfer can be. And I think this is one of the examples of how this technique can be applied in a more interesting way. So if you kind of broaden the, de the definition of what style can be to um, Google Maps, calligraphy, or astronomy, or sometimes also if you just combine different artistic styles to come up with something really unique, that could also work. And um, recently, Sophia Crespo has been an artist who's been working with style transfer in some way. I think she's been minimizing the content, which is one of the two components in, in, the, in the system. And she's been coming up with these uh, crazy new underwater creatures, which I think are quite beautiful. And uh, they kind of show how some of these algorithms can be creative and come up with new kind of visuals and uh, creatures that didn't exist before, but could have maybe. And uh, then came something called the GAN, and uh, this is already also like a couple of years ago, and um, I feel the art world is still very much excited with using the GANs or the generative adversarial networks to uh, generate images. And this is because partly when they first came out, they produced um, a lot of uh, images that had eyes or kind of limbs misplaced. So they were quite realistic, but something was a little bit off with them. And a lot of people in the art community found that quite exciting. And uh, you can sort of see that in the work by Mario Klingerman. And um, I think he is one of the most exciting AI artists in terms of really knowing how to combine all the different techniques to render visuals of, uh, I guess, the human face or the human form. And this is some of his work from two or three years ago. And um, sometimes people from the art world say that it reminds them of Francis Bacon, because I guess also the, the face is uh, a little bit mashed up. And uh, yeah, the limbs are sometimes odd. But um, yeah, initially, this is kind of the way the algorithm tried to um, yeah, construct the human body. And yeah, this is some of Mario Klingemann's work from last year. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's much more realistic. And uh, yeah, Mario Klingemann is very prolific. And if you're interested in seeing more work like that, I recommend that you find him on Twitter. He has an account at uh, Quasimondo. And there's lots of different kind of uh, facial images that he's done. And nowadays, of course, uh, a lot of these AI techniques enable us to generate some very realistic images of uh, politicians and celebrities and, uh, and other people. And artists are also starting to experiment with, with some of these techniques. And one of these artists is uh, Libby Heaney. And she tried to do this kind of deep fake um, artwork called uh, Euro Revision, which uh, combines two, two politicians, say Theresa May and Angela Merkel, who, this doesn't have sound, but if it did, then they would be reciting uh, Dada poetry, kind of based on the political speeches. And uh, yeah, also kind of singing along for um, Eurovision. And now I'll move on to some artistic projects which, uh, unlike the first group I showed, which focus more on the technique, like this group of artists focus more on the data set, which is, of course, kind of very, very important in terms of determining what kind of image or artwork you will end up with in the end. And um, I like to start with uh, this work by Roman Lipsky, who is uh, a landscape um, artist uh, based in Berlin and uh, he's been painting lots of kind of landscapes in his career. He was never particularly interested by the digital world until at some point he decided to work with a team of technologists to see how he could uh, augment or change his practice. And um, so this is a black and white photograph of a night scene in LA and uh, 
Roman Lipsky proceeded to make uh, nine different paintings based on this night scene. And this is kind of his typical style at the time. So normally it's just black and then one type of color in each image. And then he gave these nine paintings to um, his technical collaborators who proceeded to train a neural network to generate images kind of in his style based on those nine paintings and this is what they got which uh, is quite different because the composition is a bit freer and there are multiple colors in each image and uh, Roman Lipsky proceeded to respond to that and make some paintings based on uh, kind of the images that were generated by the machine and this is what he has done so uh, yeah, he's tried sometimes to include different colors and uh, yeah, the composition sometimes becomes a bit more abstract. And then again, this set went into the machine to generate those images which are kind of abstract and sometimes have some very um, odd color combinations. And again, Roman Lipsky painted uh, a, a response to that and yeah, this is very much abstract. And let's see if I have, yeah. So as you can see, I think this shows how you can use some of these um, yeah, machine learning techniques to help you perhaps come up with ideas also based on kind of uh, your own paintings and how you can challenge your practice and um, kind of your ways of working without necessarily just Kind of sticking to working in the digital form because ultimately his final works are still paintings which um, I find uh, refreshing sometimes in the digital world and next artist I, I like to mention is um, Anna Riddler who is also very much concerned about the data sets she uses to make her own work and uh, in, uh, in a piece she did called Fall of the House of Usher, which is based on this black and white film. Um, I think it was from 1929, and it's based on an Edgar Allan Poe short story. What she did was she made 200 ink drawings, like, like this image, and here are some more images that she kind of painted herself from uh, watching this short film. And then she proceeded to train uh, pix to pix so one of these uh, neural network algorithms to generate um, images in her style and compile them into an animation, which you can see here. And um, I, I work quite closely with this artist. And for me, it's always been quite interesting to hear um, about her kind of perspective and what she has noticed about the changes I, I, I guess what the machine has picked up from her style. So here, as, as you can see, sometimes the eyebrows and the eyes would be kind of generated by the machine in a very similar fashion. And that's because in her artistic practice, uh, Anna Riddler might draw these like facial features very similarly. And so the machine would also get confused. Or sometimes there would be a background object that appears or reappears because to an artist, if it's a background object, it might not be very important and it might be left off occasionally. And of course, the machine would also kind of pick up on that and uh, it would basically amplify or reinforce all the kind of stylistic and artistic decisions made by the artist. And uh, similarly to Roman Lipsky, she also did um, kind of this process where she gave some of um, her, yes, yes, so she generated the first video based on uh, an original set of 200 ink drawings she made. And then once she got the generated video, she made another set of ink drawings, which then, and which then went into the machine to generate the second video. And then from the images of the second video, she generated more, uh, she drew more images that kind of gave her this version. So yeah, a little bit complicated, but you can also kind of see how the generated image changes a bit. It becomes a bit more kind of abstract and blurry um, every time. And yeah, I guess that's 
partly due to the kind of the new versions of um, of the ink drawings that Anna makes that uh, match the style of the previous um, films. And yeah, these are some of the ink drawings. And then just to give you an idea of also how some of these techniques can be um, applied to very different types of data sets, then this is some work by uh, Jagor Kraft um, looking at uh, the sculptures from antiquity. And nowadays, if you go to a lot of the museums, you will notice that um, a lot of the sculptures, they have uh, maybe the noses or parts of the head missing because they've been around for like 2,000 years or longer. And uh, what this artist tried to do is uh, he tried to, um, yeah, to, to, to train an AI on these images of antique sculptures and get them to generate various designs, as you can see here. And uh, some of them are perhaps not as realistic as, as others and a bit more fantastical. But in the end, what he did was he created uh, an exhibition where he 3D printed some of the kind of components uh, generated by, um, by his designs and, and complemented some of the existing um, sculptures with that. So uh, these are some examples. And uh, now I will move on to a series of works that uh, look at this uh, AI theme a little bit more critically, perhaps. And um, I'll start with this by uh, Scott Kelly and uh, Ben Polkinghorne, who are two artists from New Zealand. And uh, they were interested in um, going to national parks and putting up these billboards which uh, gave you recommendations of where else you could go to, so other national parks, because clearly what you want to see in a national park is uh, recommendations of what else you can do and reminders of kind of technology and capitalism and uh, all this other stuff. And this is some more of their work. And then also this, and I particularly like this one because it blocks the slides, so you can't actually use the playground anymore, really, if you want to slide down safely. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, kind of, it's, it's a great comment on how we are excessively influenced by technology and by these uh, recommender systems in our lives. And um, to show how kind of AI or some of these bot-generated images or sculptures can impact uh, a community, um, I, I like to show this work by Julien de Suez and Matt Plummer Fernandez, um, who were, or I guess they like this website called Thingiverse, which has lots of different designs of, um, I guess, uh, 3D models that you can print and then maybe use for something. And I think these are examples of some of the models that you can kind of find on the website. And uh, they created a bot that made a mashup of all these models. And these are some examples. The titles were also, I think, uh, machine generated. So this is an open overlord nozzle, and that's a plastic action car. And I guess if you were looking for a useful design, um, or useful or practical design on the platform, that might not be quite it. But yeah, anyway, this platform became overflowing with, with these designs because the bot was creating mashups and it was posting all the time on the news feed. And um, it was really interesting to see what the feedback was from the community because some people were wondering whether that was actually spam or if it was just like a human way of kind of communicating. And then somebody was just very annoyed that this bot was hogging all the attention because it kept dominating the news feed. And then somebody else at the bottom, they were just really happy that the model became part of this kind of artwork. So I think it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting to see the diversity of the reactions and kind of makes people think as to what is kind of human generated artwork, what isn't. And uh, ultimately it became an exhibition where all these uh, kind of mashups became printed and exhibited in, in the Netherlands. And uh, visitors could vote whether it was art or spam. And I think art got a lot of votes 
but if you go to an art gallery, maybe you are expecting art, so maybe there is some bias there. And um, yeah, there's, there's also um, lots of artists who are very much preoccupied with the, the influence these AI techniques are having in our society, particularly in terms of facial recognition. Seems to be, yeah, uh, quite a popular topic. And uh, this is some work by Constant Dillard called Dull Dream. So if you remember, I showed you the multicolored deep dream at the beginning. So this is kind of the opposite. So this algorithm works by reducing kind of the features in an image. So it becomes more blurry. And yeah, this is one example. This is another. And yeah, you probably can't recognize Trump so well on this image on the right. And um, there's also a website called dulldream.xyz where you can go and upload your own picture. And then it would also be kind of changed a bit. So it's not really recognized by uh, by others and by computer systems as you. So it's, uh, I guess, an attempt to hide away from the facial recognition algorithms and surveillance systems and so on. This is similar to what Adam Harvey has been doing in his project uh, CV Dazzle, which has been going on, I think, for about four years or so. And um, he, he worked out that uh, a couple of years back, if you added one, you know, if you added two triangles to your face, then it would not be detected as a face. But if you only had one, yes, the face would be recognized. Also, if you had a wacky hairstyle, sometimes your face would not be detected. But I think nowadays, um, I'm not sure if all these kind of tricks would pass. So he, is, uh, he has a new project called Hyperface, which I think works in a different fashion by trying to blend your face into the texture of the background behind it. Um, but yeah, still kind of very much looking at how you can um, avoid facial recognition. And then I think, yeah, I'll, I'll mention one or two projects because I'm close to running out of time. And um, this one by Shung Sun Bak, uh, Kim Young Hung. Um, who, who are a duo of artists based in South Korea, and they still work with this kind of a facial recognition technique, but in a more of a fine art context. And um, they worked together with various painters who were given the task to paint a portrait together with a facial recognition um, algorithm, which was kind of looking at, the, at what they were painting. And uh, if it detected a face, then the artist had to kind of do something to the painting so that it would not be detected as a face. And these are the portraits it, uh, uh, some, of, some of the artists came out with. And I think some of these you can probably recognize as, well, it could be a portrait. But I always think that this one on the left, I would not immediately think it's like a portrait. It seems to be quite, quite different from what um, I would imagine as a portrait. And uh, I think I'm pretty much out of time, so I will skip through all of these remaining ones. But I'll get to the slide with my email in case you do have uh, any questions. You can always write to me, or I think there might be some time for questions now. Riva, thank you.